Uh, as Noah said, my name is Jason Mastriana, uh, user experience and user interface team leader at the Health and Technology Innovation Center. And I lead Christiana Care's user experience initiatives. One of the Innovation Center's primary roles is to build software solutions that software need or pain point that's not currently addressed by a commercially available solution and to provide those solutions to our users where they need it and when they need it. So user experience fundamentals and human-centered design is really embedded into the Innovation Center's DNA and applied at every stage of development on every project we are working on. It's really key to creating human-centered solutions that provide value to our users and to the organization. This is why every member of our team, including developers, engineers, and analysts, are all certified usability analysts. In fact, any new members joining the team are required to become a CUA as part of their onboarding process. And I think it's worth saying that usability and human-centered design is it's everyone's responsibility. It, it's not just the CUAs on your team. Uh, it, everyone is responsible for why you know, UX is so important and engaging it. And you know, we offer UX talks for our departments. We provide consultation sessions. And we even facilitate in-house training with HFI to certify other teams and caregivers, including folks from IT, marketing, and even doctors and nurses. So today I wanna to talk to you about some of the best practices and standards that the Innovation Center applies when creating solutions for our patients and caregivers. As we know, user experience is the key to how people perceive a product, an environment, or interaction. And individuals will move through numerous touch points along a user experience journey, interpreting that journey through perception and senses. Just to check, do you have slides? No slides. Okay, okay, that's fine. I didn't interrupt, go ahead. Sorry. I am the slide. I, I love it, I'm totally for that. I just wanted to make sure we weren't missing it if you were sharing slides. No, you got no. it, Jason, go ahead. You're so, doing great. As I was mentioning, you know, moving through those numerous touch points along his user experience journey, interpreting that journey through all of our senses. And that's really how we determine, is it a positive experience or a negative one? And as user experience analysts, we know it's critical to put the user first understand who they are, their goals, their environment, and understand their pain points and challenges. And these fundamentals absolutely apply here in healthcare. So for example, when we think about patients coming into the hospital, we need to think beyond just the interactions they have with their caregivers. Uh, those interactions are a very important aspect of the experience, but we need to think about the entire journey. We need to think about how are patients finding information about services we offer? Are they able to easily make an appointment in a way that meets their mental model? Are they able to find parking when they arrive? And how does the lobby feel when they walk in? And are they even able to find the floor in the room that they are looking for? Do they understand the directions their caregivers provided before sending them home and so on? So as caregivers, we don't know if someone is coming into the hospital on the best day of their life because they're about to hold the newest edition of their family for the first time, or if it's the worst day because they may be saying goodbye to a loved one one last time. So we need to be conscious and we need to understand all of the touch points and scenarios in which users may encounter along that journey to ensure we are providing an experience that contributes to their health and well being and that does not contribute to additional anxiety and fear that some individuals may already be experiencing. The Innovation Center had the opportunity you know, to collaborate with a project uh, with our Cancer Center team a few years ago, and that was called Positive Distraction Therapy. This project started out as a conversation over dinner between a caregiver and their friend who was a patient at the Cancer Center and wanted something to pass the time while receiving chemotherapy treatments. Now, chemotherapy is traditionally administered in a group setting and other than TVs or speaking with other patients and family members, patients have little to distract themselves from their surroundings and the situation. For some patients, these, in this environment can result in boredom and anxiety. So patients might even see others around them who are not doing well with their treatments, leading to symptom distress and eventually discontinue their treatment early. So this was an opportunity to address a critical pain point and build a solution that could provide a positive impact on our patients. 
And again, this project really began simply by having a conversation and actively listening to a pain point that someone is experiencing firsthand. And the key to any user experience is to know thy user, for they are not you. The Innovation Center collaborated with the experts from the Cancer Center so that we could gain a better understanding of the users, which in this case included the patients and the caregivers working in the Cancer Center at the time. By collaborating with the Cancer Center, we gained crucial insights and we didn't have to rely on making assumptions. We could see firsthand what was involved when patients entered the cancer center, how they checked in, uh, where they sat, and how they even received treatment. Everyone on the team continuously observed how caregivers and patients interacted with one another to fully understand all of the touch points involved. Again, this is why it's important that everyone on the team understands the fundamental principles of user experience, not just the CUAs, because everyone can help bring a diverse perspective and their expertise to a project. From there, we could begin making decisions on how to best deliver an experience for our patients in that setting. Now, at that time, we already were exploring some immersive technologies, such as virtual reality, and that appeared to be a good fit for this project. But there was a lot of unknowns going into this project. Will the patients want to use virtual reality? Will the videos make the patients feel sick? Will they like wearing a headset? Can we keep the equipment clean? And what equipment do we need? And more importantly, will this negatively impact the caregiver's workflow? But it's through the continuous observation, working with the caregivers, being hands-on, and talking with real users, we could gain the information we needed. And we ended up building a custom software solution that provided our patients with a way to virtually leave the four walls of the hospital during their treatments and be immersed in the sights and sounds of tropical beaches, majestic waterfalls, and even kangaroo watching, which that was a popular one. And in fact, during the beginning stages of the project, most of the videos being shown to patients were homemade and featured local areas and landmarks. I will never forget though, one patient who just finished watching a video of one of the local beaches here in Delaware, that she loved going to as she was growing up. And after she watched this video, she could not wait to speak with the other caregivers and the other patients about how much that experience meant to her. She even said that she was looking forward to her next treatment so she could have that experience again. And that's why user experience and human-centered design is so important. That's why we do what we do because of the impacts we have on someone's life. This was a really special project to be a part of and the work resulted in Christiana Care receiving the 2018 Magnet Award for innovative use of virtual reality during chemotherapy. Again, I can't stress enough, working with our caregivers is important because they are the experts in the field and have a deeper understanding of the needs and pain points in, in their fields. They see it firsthand. Uh, another project we had the pleasure of working on is called Crititrack. Uh, this time we worked with the caregivers from our Medical Intensive Care Unit, or MICU, who are currently looking for a more efficient and accurate way to capture code blue events. Now, a code blue event is when someone goes into cardiac or respiratory arrest and needs immediate resuscitation. So when an individual codes, a code team engages following specific processes and guidelines. Our team here at Christiana Care follow uh, the American Heart Association Guidelines for Advanced Cardiac Life Support, or ACLS, to bring that individual back and stabilize them. So as you can imagine, these codes can happen at any time, anywhere, and it's a pretty chaotic environment as caregivers are literally rushing to a location to save someone's life. And during these events, the code team must document everything from when CPR is started to when a shock is administered, or even when medication, medications such as epinephrine are administered. And traditionally, these items are captured on paper, or depending on where they are, sometimes paper towels, or their scrubs, depending on what they have access to. And, and this is not ideal. And as for documenting the time of the code, one team member may look at their watch, and another team member may be looking at the clock on the wall. So there's a pretty good chance those are not in sync. So it's important to document these events to ensure the teams are following the correct guidelines, 
but especially in the unfortunate event of when an individual cannot be resuscitated and the family member wants to know exactly what just happened to their loved one. So it can be difficult to manually write down and capture everything that's happening while trying to save a life. And this is a pain point felt in health systems across the country, if not the world. So again, we are going to apply our user experience best practices here and engage with our caregivers from the MICU who are the experts in the field and who can provide us with detailed requirements and knowledge about the problem firsthand that needs to be solved. Plus, our caregivers are not just the knowledge experts in this case, they are also the users. So speaking with them directly is critical. Uh, we met with the MICU team weekly, gathering information on current processes, requirements, key stakeholders, and even watching Code Blue training videos to fully understand what is involved during these events. And as CUAs, we did everything we could to immerse ourselves in this world so that we could put ourselves in their shoes, you know, in the shoes of our caregivers. We decided that a digital touchscreen solution would allow us to create an interface that the caregivers could easily and efficiently select events that would traditionally be handwritten, such as the CPR start time and the administered shock, even the jewels of those shocks. So during those weekly meetings, based on the requirements we gathered, we began creating wireframes of how that interface may appear. And we tested those wireframes, sometimes on paper, sometimes using click maps while watching a simulation video of a code blue to ensure that the interface matched the caregiver's mental model and provided the required options. As I mentioned before, these code events can happen in very chaotic environments. So at the time, the 12.9 inch Apple iPad Pro was a perfect option that provided us the screen real estate to have large hit points that would benefit the users in all environments. We of course still evaluated how the iPad may work on a traditional code cart, you know, used during a code blue event, whether it could be kept clean and charged for that matter. And the best way to do that, have an actual code cart delivered to the office. So as development began on the software, we continued to test against simulation videos and with members of the MICU team, along with some other folks in the office to ensure that the interface that we were building was intuitive for anyone. And by building this as a digital solution, we had the ability to present the user with prompts based on the American Heart Association algorithm and would allow users to know exactly when to prepare for and administer shock or administer epinephrine and so on. So users who are not experienced with Code Blues or the AHA algorithm could still complete the documentation process from beginning to end. And one thing I should mention here is applying UX practices in human-centered design does not mean you cannot be agile. I know there's some discussion around that. This project went from concept to reality and was the as deployed as a proof of concept in two clinical areas in just six weeks. And in that time, CritiTrack reduced variability, improved the coordination of care delivery, captured data efficiently, and was 100% compliant with the AHA guidelines. And today, CritiTrack is currently being used in all of the intensive care units across Christiana Care and has a patent pending for how this information is being presented. So again, it, it's all about the user. If you speak with users and just simply observe and listen, you can identify true pain points. And if you can solve for those true pain points, you are creating a solution that provides value. The final project I wanted to share with you today revolves around voice user interfaces and engaging patients and providing care where they need it, when they need it. As we know, voice assistants such as Alexa and Siri are now in our phones and smart speakers and even our TVs and cars, and all of these devices respond to voice commands. Statista reports that by the end of 2020, there will be 4.2 billion voice assistants being used around the world and 110 million virtual assistant users in the U.S. alone. The forecast suggests that by the year 2024, the number of voice assistants will reach 8.4 billion units. That's higher than the world's population. So there's no denying that voice user experiences and interactions are the future of how we will interact with everything from 
apps on our phones, our kitchen appliances, um, and even how we engage and receive healthcare. As with the current global pandemic that we are all living in, it's especially important to be able to provide care where they need it. And a lot of times today, that's in the home. The Voice Experience Project started from a caregiver in our home health team who had an idea for an Alexa skill that could provide an interactive and accessible option for home health patients to engage with elements of their plan of care, health goals, and general safety issues. And it would also act as an extension of the patient's plan of care in between visits from their home health caregivers. And the vision was to have the experience customized for that patient. So the voice interface would be able to say what medication they need to take, why they need to take it, and even when. This was an amazing opportunity to reach our home health patient population. And it aligns with the current healthcare landscape and our vision here at Christiana Care in which all care that can be digital will be digital and all care that can be delivered in the home will be delivered in the home. So again, we collaborated with our home health experts. In fact, we facilitated a design sprint with the home health team to identify and understand the key stakeholders, discuss their pain points, brainstorm ideas on functionality and features. And we even did a very quick usability test at the end of the sprint. Now, Unfortunately, we couldn't build a completely functional Alexa skill in five days, but we could identify what questions and answers the skill could potentially handle. And as you know, especially in today's world, we need to get creative with how we can observe and test users. So we had a colleague in one room acting as the Alexa skill with a list of predetermined responses. And we brought users who sat in another room and using the Alexa intercom feature, we were able to test the skill, observe the interactions, confirm and validate if a voice interface was even a viable solution for our home health patients. And it was. So we dove right in, identifying how to create the features needed and researching the capabilities of the voice assistants that were available. We tested devices in various environments, and we even observed home health patients in their homes to understand how and if this device could be used. Again, know thy user. I cannot emphasize that enough. We created storyboards and conversation flows for all of the features and captured all of the different ways users may ask for information and how we could deliver information to the user without overwhelming them. So usability best practices and data shows us that it's always best to group or chunk information in about three to five things to make it easier for users to understand and retain that information. So we use that principle and by delivering information in three to five chunks, we could design an experience based on user recognition as opposed to recall, allowing users to remember information easier. And as part of the conversation flow, we tested throughout every phase to identify any conversation gaps. The voice experience should feel natural and should be able to handle all of the various ways users will ask for or deliver information. And we never want to leave our users with a response like, I don't know, or I don't understand. That's, that's frustrating for the user. Instead, we always provided the user with an option and a path forward. So even if that path forward is a way for them to contact customer support when encountering an error, we gave them that option. The voice experience concept is now a reality and is an Alexa skill called Home Care Coach currently being offered to our home health patients here at Christiana Care, and it is among one of Amazon's first HIPAA eligible skills. So by engaging patients digitally in the home, it will help empower individuals to reach their health goals and improve their experience. So when creating any type of ex experience, whether it's a smartphone application, a voice interface, a theme park, or whether it's for entertainment or for taking care of people, applying user experience best practices and human-centered design is critical for building solutions that solve for true pain points and provide value. Observation is crucial to fully understanding the user, especially when you need to observe users in a challenging environment. So get creative with how you can gather that information and encourage your other team members not just the CUAs on your team, to get out there and find ways to ensure you are not missing out on these key details. 
And at the core of all of this is empathy, right? Always, always put the user first. Keep asking them the question why. Dig deep into the real pain points and issues because it's then you will find new ways that you can impact your user's life in a positive, meaningful way. So I thank you so much for your time. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. And I thank you all for being champions of user experience and human-centered design. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Jason, that was great. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's dive into the questions. They're, they're in the Q&A box. And if anyone hasn't yet, take a look over there, upload questions, add questions. Um, let's do this one here. It's at the top of the box now. It says, do you assign CUAs to different parts of the journey or does everyone work on the entire experience together? So traditionally, we work on a project together. Uh, you know, I think it's really important. Everyone has their expertise. Everyone has their perspective and their experiences that have brought them to this point. So um, we really bring everyone in for the entire journey. And, you know, the, the positive distraction therapy piece uh, project that I was talking about with the virtual reality and the cancer center, everyone on the team, developers, engineers, analysts, managers, team leaders, everyone went to the cancer center. We were all there hands-on talking to the patients, working with those caregivers. So everyone is aware of what's happening. And, you know, again, I think it's important to have those different experiences and different perspectives of how we can improve ex an experience uh, that maybe one person wouldn't think of. So I would encourage that if possible, your entire team is a part of it, or at least at the very least have a meeting that, that shows the research and the observations that some of your, your members are finding because otherwise they're going to be out of the loop. You know, how can you design a feature that's going to help a patient if you don't know why you're making it or why they need it? So making assumptions uh, is, is never a good thing. Great. Uh, next up, speaking to your experience of UX within Agile, did those six weeks include the design and observation phase or was that exclusively development? If it's the former, if it included the design and observation phase, do you have any advice for successfully implementing UX in an agile or safe format? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, so when we met with the MICU team, they had presented this idea to us uh, you know, about the code blue and documentation. We immediately met with them. And again, the whole team's meeting with them. It's not just one or two people and then communicating it later. But we all got in a room together that was pre-COVID at that time. So we were all able to get into a room together and talk about the need. Uh, we were able to watch those Code Blue videos together. So we did the discovery phase, if you will, during that six weeks. We were able to create the wireframes. We were able to do the development. You know, sometimes we do a, a minimal viable product, something that we can just get out to the folks to prove the value. Because the one thing we don't want to do, and, and this is key, I think, for any agile teams, is see, you know, do as much as you can do. See what you can accomplish because you don't want to involve infrastructure and all these other teams because one, it won't be agile anymore. They have their own processes and steps. But you want to prove out that value first as your team. And I think that's why it's key to have the analysts and engineers and developers on your teams. And it's even better if they're all certified usability analysts because then they're all coming from the same perspective. But because we were in that unique situation, we were able to, yes, do the observation, development, and roll that out within six weeks. And you know we were able to prove out the value of CritiTrack just in a couple of weeks after that. And now that's why CritiTrack is a viable solution and a trusted solution here at Christiana Care. Great question, thank you. Awesome, I think we have time for, for a little more. Um, so this person's asking, some, persons, some companies that I've worked for have said that we don't have time for usability testing. How would you test users if you're restricted in that way? That is always a great question. I, I would always say, if someone had the time to tell you they don't have the time for testing, you had the time for testing. I mean, you could do, a quick observation on a piece of paper, a wireframe drawn on a napkin, put it in front of a user, ask some questions and just start getting feedback. Are the buttons labeled correctly? You know, can they find what you think they should be finding and, and looking for? And we have a lot of great tools, you know, digital tools, optimal workshop and things of that nature, but nothing beats just 
hand drawing something on a piece of paper and putting it in front of a user. And I would say from an ROI perspective, a lot of companies will say they don't have the time for testing, but do you have time to work on a project for three months, six months, and you're building that off of assumptions. And at the end of those six months or nine months, whatever it might be, none of your users want to use it. They find it frustrating. It's buggy and it doesn't answer any of the pain points they even had. So is it more valuable time to take 30 minutes to talk to a user or would you rather spend six or nine months building a solution that has no value and no one wants to use? So I would say there is absolutely always time for testing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I've heard a few phrases like that of like, uh, everything gets usability tested eventually. If you skip it, then the first time the user sees it is your first usability test and that's an expensive way to do it. Yeah, or exactly. yeah, do you have time to not do it, right? Same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, next up, yeah, uh, so with voice assistance, uh, so, so yeah, the, the voice assistance, do, do you have time to worry about, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, miss, uh, I'm not saying that quite right. With voice assistance, did you have to worry about violating the HIPAA regulations with regards to medication reminders? Uh, for example, was there a concern about someone other than the patient overhearing the voice assistant? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. That, that was part of our processes. And in fact, we started working on this solution before Amazon was even ready. This was before Amazon was even HIPAA compliant. And, mm -hmm. and that brings me up to a point of, I would say anytime you're trying to develop a solution for a true pain point for your, your user, don't let technology restrict you. You know, we knew Amazon at the time had some limitations, but we kind of assumed that at some point they were going to get to a level that was going to accept a, a solution like this. And, and that's what happened. So we built it in the mindset knowing that, yes, we have to keep HIPAA in mind. This was not ready for prime time or for the market at that point, because again, Amazon wasn't. But we then started working with Amazon on this and became, you know, got to collaborate with some of their health teams that were slowly starting to roll out that HIPAA compliant or HIPAA eligible pieces. And by working with their health teams and our experts and legal here at the Christiana Care, we were able to make sure that we stayed within those, those refinements uh, you might know that Alexa now has a, a passcode that you have to say uh, before you can get into some, some medical information. And they're still working through that process as well, but we wanted to try something. We built it. Am Amazon finally you know, lifted those restrictions and we were able to implement that. And now that solution is a reality. And honestly, uh, we're going to see a lot more medical oriented voice assistant type applications as we move forward and probably brand new laws regarding from HIPAA and you know from the, the products that we're seeing out there. So you're definitely gonna see more of this.